So where can we find out about these announcements? Somebody yell it out. On the website, online, you got it. Or in your email, could be there as well, right? If you get our newsletter. Could be in the spam in the trash somewhere, hopefully not. <laughs> and it's only appropriate that the IT guy says that, you know, it's only appropriate. So if you look here, right, so we got June, if you can believe it, oh my goodness, we're in the second week already. Father's Day next weekend. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Couple things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, so this week, right, obviously, every Wednesday night prayer meeting, which we need, by the way, hey, that's like a really big deal around here. Super, super, super important. And when you look at the Old Testament and you look at, uh, in the New Testament, especially, when you look at how the gospel would move, right, teaching and prayer, they're here and here. It wasn't like lopsided in any way, like prayer is massive, and that enables us for doors and for things to be open in and around this town that normally we can't get to by our natural logic, by our natural resources, um, by whatever maybe we can conjure up strategy-wise. There is still a battle of good and evil of the devil against what God wants to build here. And he's entrusted us, those that believe in him that are covered by the blood of Jesus, to advance the kingdom and it starts with prayer. So Wednesday nights, man, massively important. So if you ever have time, if you're ever free and you can do it, even if it's only once a month, once a month or something, you're going to want to come. So that's every Wednesdays. This Thursday, we start up our uh, small group in town here when God's Spirit moves. And that's going to be, yes, at 6.30. All the fine print details as far as where, address, that can all be found on the website that we, yes, have. That we, yes, have. It's right on there, okay? <laughs> um, and then if you skip down, let's see here. It looks like we got the teens hanging out on the 24th at 6 p.m. I'm not quite sure the details on that. And yes, we got our men's fellowship coming up that last Saturday like we do. Um, business meeting at the end of the month. So we try and do those right quarterly to where we'll just talk about our facilities, uh, our finances, overall vision, what's going on. So it's basically just a family meeting. So if you could make a little bit extra time for yourself on that Sunday and the last Sunday of the month, if you're a member or really want to be a member, you're going to want to come to that meeting and just figure out like what's going on, what's God, how's God leading, what's he moving, like how are things shaking out, okay? And oh, the other thing I wanted to let you know too is, so for those that serve on Sunday mornings, because Grace Lutheran has their time starts later, right, so we got a little bit of that overlap, right? So typically what we've done in the past for people that serve, we always pray in the morning, um, typically have to kind of set everything up, get everything going. But now that doesn't work out so well because they don't really leave here until about 11. And so if we wait, we, we can't really have prayer time like, and if they run a little bit late like today, it really doesn't work out. Like a rushed prayer time that just checks off a box. How many people know we don't want to do that? Nah, man, we just don't want to go through the motions and do stuff like that. Right, so I want to dedicate some time to it. So when you are serving on Sunday mornings and you do want to pray, even if you don't serve, but you want to come join prayer time, we're going to do uh, 10, we'll say 1035, 1040, because volunteers are typically here at 1030, so if they're running a little bit late, that way that accounts for that. So 1035, 1040 next door. All right, so that's when we'll do our prayer time. Okay, so you might be like, oh, wait, I thought we were meeting for prayer. Where is it? Da-da-da. All right, so we're just doing it early. That way it leaves us a little bit of time so we could do that and then get to the things that we have to do. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, two things that are not on here I just want to say, just look ahead towards. In July is going to be our Sunday fun day. All right, so that'll be no service that day, right? We'll be down at the park and um, hanging out, eating, just having a really good time together. And in August... Uh, we're going to have our block party at the end of August as well. So we'll be on the green. And, uh, you know, it'll be a big turnout like last time. There'll be like a lot of people in town there. We're going to need like all hands on deck for that. It'll be a shortened service that Sunday. And uh, the gospel will be presented in a lot of different ways. There's going to be games, uh, inflatables for the kids, you know, free food, all that stuff. So you definitely want to try and make that. Even if you're not going to serve there, you still want to like just go, just rub el elbows with, just get to know people in town. It'll be really good. Yes? 
You know, that's, no. They don't have all of them that settled yet. So this week, Brian, you're probably going to get a call for your band and say, hey. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, because actually we had a planning meeting this week, Brian, and we are just fine-tuning some details. And uh, I tried to, uh, I really sold myself on just becoming like the musician-like planning part, so we got more control on that. We have more control on that this year, all right? So these are things that are ahead. Again, you can check our website um, under the Serve tab. It's all there. I gave you guys all the password. What's the password? Matthew 28, 19. That's intentional, right? It's on purpose, okay? Um, or you can check your email or on the calendar online. All right, if you could, open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. So, Spirit of God, um, I just pray that whatever we talk about in our, in our brief time that we have together, that it would be your words just guiding all of it. And uh, I just pray, Father, that you would help shed light, teach us um, about how you operate, about what you're like. Um, we allow you, Holy Spirit, the ultimate teacher, to teach us to guide us, to inform us, to equip us. We know that you're speaking and it's our heart's desire to want to listen. To want to listen, to embrace transformation that you're doing in each of our lives. And I thank you for that good news of transformation. And I just pray, Lord, that as we hear your voice, um, that we'd be sensitive to it and that we wouldn't dismiss it. And it's just this is just not a time to be more educated or even more inspired. We want it to lead to change, Holy Spirit. And I thank you that we're, you can help us do that. You will help us do that. You never give us a goal and have us go somewhere without also offering to equip us, help us, and carry us. So we love you. And we ask that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Acts 4. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you a question that um, I just want you to think about. And we'll sort of revisit back at the end, okay? So we're in chapter 4. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 32. And your bulletin there says we're going to stop at verse 11, but we're actually going to go to verse 16. But I want to read you this question, and then just think about it. I want you just to think about it. Let me see how I wrote it down. Okay, so it says, Are there certain things that we could do or not do that would contribute to experiencing or not experiencing the power of the Spirit in a church environment. Alright? I just want you to think about it. Okay? Don't yell anything out. Don't like... I just want you to think about it. Are there certain things that we could do or not do that would contribute to experiencing or not experiencing the power of the Spirit in a church environment. <laughs> That's a very worthwhile thing to think about. The last, part? the last part. I'm not sure what last is for you, but I'll say that would contribute to experiencing or not experiencing the power of the Spirit in a church environment. So, what I want to do is I want you to think about that. You'll have opinions on that for sure. All opinions are legal. All opinions are legal. The idea is that the Holy Spirit is trying to get us to think in such a way to where, what does God say about it, so that way that can be final. You know, what does God have to say about His environment and His people, and about how the Spirit of God sort of works and interacts in the environment of His people? Is it sort of just the same all the time? Is there anything that we can do to detract from that? Anything that we can do to enhance that? Um, or do we sort of just passively sit back? Or how busy and active should we or should we not be? These are things we should be thinking about. Because if we call ourselves a church family, the assumption, the impl implication is that we really want the Spirit of God heavy and strong and prominent in our midst or wherever we go. Amen? So we know that Jesus said 
Wherever two or three are gathered, I'm there in their midst, right? Even if you don't know much about the Bible, a lot of, a lot of people at least have heard some kind of version of that. So that seems to entail that God's Spirit is among His people. But in that question, it really came down to really experiencing that, seeing that, having that be manifested. So I just want you to think about that, okay? So Acts 4, and I promise we'll get back to it after. Acts 4. So what I did is, as you can see in your bulletin there, I just got three sections for you, and we're going to break these down. And in those bulletins there, I, these are the three sections I divided up into. We have the environment, the deception, and the fruit. So those are three ways that we're going to look at this passage. So if you don't have a Bible, you're not following along, you're definitely going to want to. You're going to want to read and look at and see what we're pulling out of it. I'll have some slides up here too. But you're going to want to look at what's going on. So you have the environment, the deception, and then the fruit. Okay? The environment, the deception, and the fruit. Because last time we left off in Acts, if you remember, Peter and John, two broke guys, were going to church. They saw a lame man there. He said, Peter said, well, you know, I don't have any money or anything, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you. Lame man gets up and walks. Everyone's going crazy, especially the lame man. Can you imagine just jumping around and running around? And for the first time, he's like 40 years old. He's running and jumping around. Just God is amazing. He is real. I, I, was like, I don't know how to explain it. You know, he's going nuts. Everyone's real happy about it. Then Peter starts to build a bridge to this supernatural event, to the supernatural God behind it. So he says, hey, this is the same God that, you know, Jesus Christ came from him. He was the Messiah, pointed to him in the Old Testament. This is what life looks like inside of him. Like, you guys gave him over to be killed, but it was really part of the plan. But now you have an opportunity. You are still in the midst of seeing what his hand is like. So respond. So he builds a bridge. Peter builds a bridge from the act to the God behind the act. And then, as you can imagine, the religious leaders were really happy, really excited. They high-fived Peter and John, and they said, let's get together and figure out how we can do more. <laughs> that didn't happen. They said, what are you doing? Don't talk about the resurrection of the dead. Can you, I mean, isn't that, isn't, it just sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, doesn't it? It's ridiculous when you read it. It's even more ridiculous when you say it out loud. So he said, don't talk about the resurrection of the dead. In whose name did you do this? And then they get all interrogated about this. They get thrown in jail about it. Then they don't know what to do. And they're just like, hey, just stop. Stop talking about in Jesus' name. Stop, stop spreading this. And then the response is very interesting. They're like, well, if you think it's right for us to listen to you instead of God, I'll leave that up to you. But for us... We're going to continue to go after what God says and keep doing these things in His name. And then they go back to a prayer meeting. And they're not distressed and down and depressed and discouraged and woe is me and very much playing a victim card. They're very excited actually. We just got thrown in jail, guys. Things were just made more difficult in our lives because of how much we believe in the power of the name of Jesus. And then they all prayed together. And it says, the place where they were just shook. And they asked the Lord, Father, give us more boldness. And also, confirm your word with more signs and wonders. So that's where we left them. So now we pick up in verse 32. So this is the part of the environment. We're going to talk about the environment of, of what these guys were in, what it was like. If you think about our environment here at CC Nagi, you might be thinking... Blue carpet, <laughs> stained windows, strange things around the room I don't really understand, but I don't want to ask because that's embarrassing. <laughs> Some people that love to cross or hate that one up there, you know, I don't know where you fall. I'm not judging anybody. Uh, hopefully, smiles are part of the environment. Hopefully, prayer is part of the environment, right? Hopefully, worship, hopefully, hands held high is part of the environment that happens here, right? Hopefully generosity right, happens in this environment. It's a lot of different things. And I want to pull out some of the things that was in their environment because it's very important to observe and notice because I want you to 
pick out some important things there. Verse 32, it says this. Bless you. All the believers were one in heart and mind. You've got to underline that. That's pretty important. One in heart and one in mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. And Joseph, everybody say Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, so we say Barnabas, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So in this environment, there's this incredible unity, amen? It's powerful. And what that does, this makes me think of, if you've just flipped back a page, well, my Bible, it's back a page. It might be one or two in yours, or maybe not at all, depending on how big or small the print is. But in Acts 2, just listen to this. Verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's a pretty awesome environment, right? I hope that there's something within your heart that like burns and yearns for that. I really do. Like I really hope in my heart of hearts, like I burn and I yearn for an environment where there's just this unity in mind and in heart. And it doesn't mean that we're going to agree on everything. It doesn't mean we're all going to think the same way about everything. But what it does mean is that we're not looking for a reason to get out. We're looking for a reason to stay in. It means there's such a locked-in vision as far as what the mission is that God has. It's like, you know what? Even though I don't prefer that second worship song, like, I'll still, just, I'll still stay in church there. <laughs> Even though somebody didn't say hi to me like they did last time, I'm going to be okay with that and I'll still extend myself. You know, like even if you didn't receive anything, you're still trying to figure out like, okay, whatever. Still, how's God choosing to use me and use us towards advancing His will and His kingdom? They were so locked in on that. That's a really big deal. And some of the fruits, oh good, he's got it up here. Some of the fruits, they were great in unity, which we just talked about. They were great in power. I mean, we just read all about that. I mean, there's like, you can't deny any of that. Supreme power. There was almost no need among them, which is really interesting. People were exceptionally generous. It's like people recognized what was going on was not ritualistic and just religious. There was something supernaturally different about them. And people were like, I'll sell my estate, I'll sell what I have, just lay it before you guys, just do what you want. I don't even care. Just go ahead and do it. Do what the Lord is doing. I'll just give that over to you. And among their immediate circle, nobody was in need. And what's really interesting, we just read, is whatever they got, they just dispersed out. They weren't looking to build a name. They weren't looking to build a movement. They, they weren't... It was so mission and kingdom mindset and focus. It's just amazing. And some of that like, has to be for us. You know, It's not about C.C. Nagy. I mean, as much as I like our church. It's not all about that at the end of the day. It's about God's kingdom and what He wants to do. Right? We're just this small part of His bride all over the globe looking to join together and say, Father, use us, spend us, however you want to do it. And we'll hook up and we'll get alongside other churches and other places that won't look like us, they won't sound like us, they'll be into different things. And that doesn't mean that now we judge it and get weird about it. We just figure out, okay, how can we make this work? And that was really important. Like, that was their environment. That's what it looked like. 
They were interested in doing life together. They weren't interested in just being a member or just like sitting in the same pew or just like being cordial with. They would like be at each other's homes, you know, breaking bread, like hanging out, just doing life together. That was the environment. And there's something pure and something beautiful and something awesome. Like in a true sense of the word awesome, not awesome like a bacon cheeseburger. I'm saying awesome in a true sense of the word. It's not just a great environment. And one thing that that does, like what it says up here, says their unity and their purity had created an environment rich with power and generosity. It's really difficult. And I'm not suggesting that we should just make formulas about things when we read out of the Bible because God is so much bigger than formulas. But He does give us things that we can observe and, and ask Him about. And at least try and go after. And then a lot of times what He'll do is customize. But in this environment, right, it was rich with unity and purity. Everybody say unity, unity. and purity. purity. They were unified together, one heart, one mind. They were pure. They were about the gospel of Jesus Christ and carrying that out. And however God wanted to do that, they wanted to do that. And that's very interesting because what that did for them, on the next slide, Sal, what it did for them is it sort of protected them and it made sort of, I don't know, bu bubble's not a great word, but it insulated them in such a way that purity and that unity just created just sort of like barrier of just protection and covering. And it made something really pure and really beautiful out of it. And what that does so we look here, it's exponentially more difficult for sin to deceitfully fester in environments that are rich with Father-exalting unity and purity. It's still going to try and sneak in there and have its way. It's bittersweet when leaders within the Christian faith, they fall. Moral failures, financial failures, like whatever happens. You know, that's heartbreaking, right? Should be heartbreaking for us. Like, that's our brother and sister. And for whatever reason, there was issues there. And it played out how it played out. And most of us are never next to the situation. So we don't know all the details. We just see the aftermath and what everybody says about it. It's craziness. The part that makes it bittersweet is you hurt for them. Because in most cases, it's been like underlying for a while. Or, you know, festering. It's been like something kind of ugly there. There have probably been signs. And they've just ignored it. Didn't want to deal with it. The bittersweet part is at least at some point in time God just said hey listen this is my bride and I just can't have this here it just can't be here I have other goals and other objectives and that allowance right that compromise that sort of justification of that sin is a problem so it's bittersweet because people, right, they fall and that's difficult and that's really hard and that hurts my heart, hopefully it hurts your heart, but at the same time, I am glad that at the end of the day, God says, hey, this is still my deal. I know these are my people, but this is still my deal. This is my bride. I'm still in control. I'm still sovereign. I remember I got a, um, a message, not, it was like a few years ago from someone, and it was an email. And, and this happens to me from, from time to time. I got an email from someone. Uh, it wasn't very long. Didn't have a lot of details in it. But as soon as I finished reading the email, I knew that I knew. I, I didn't have any reason to know this. I just knew. Immediately, what went off in my mind is, this is, this is about uh, something incredibly sexual. It's a very short email. There's not a lot of details. But they, said, but they wrote this thing. And uh, so in my mind, I'm like, this is, this is incredibly sexual. That what? Now I feel like I'm judging them. Now I think I, I have an issue. Fast forward a little bit. It comes out, that particular situation was extremely, extremely wrongly sexual and very bad and, and things went sideways really fast. And what I, the reason why I share that is because that's an example of what we're trying to cultivate and build here is, 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 again, not just some movement and not just some church. We want to just 
We want to just be with the Holy Spirit and whatever He's doing and go in that direction. And the Holy Spirit really enjoys that. And He says, you know what? I want to dwell amongst those people that are after unity. Right? That are after being together, after purity. And so, I just get a word of wisdom on an email that was like four sentences. Well, I think I'm judging the person, and it wasn't judging them at all. It was the Spirit of God saying, no, be careful on this one. And so, I could have a false sense of humility and be like, oh, uh, you know, you shouldn't think that way about people. That's really negative. And, but that's not what was happening. It wasn't what was happening. And I sat on it. I didn't say anything to anyone. Because I, I was scared of it. You know, I don't want to... But then it played out, and I was like, oh my gosh. And that's happened a handful number of times. Where God would just, in this environment, what we're trying to create and build is something that's strong in unity, strong in purity. And I've sat back multiple times and been like, Father, I am so grateful. I didn't know any of, like, any of this stuff. Not because I'm like an idiot or I'm trying to remove myself or just being stupid, because that can happen too, by the way. But, thank you, Holy Spirit, for just bringing that stuff out to the light, to the surface. Thank you. And what that does for me, number one, is it immediately sobers me up in whatever way I need to be sobered. And then it also gives me a greater appreciation and richness for what God is building here. So when you think about that question asked in the beginning, an environment of God's people is about so much more than can you get a memory verse? Do you have the right answer? You know, did you do this or did you do that? It's there's something that the Spirit of God is doing, is stirring, is building up, and we want to catch that wave and pay attention to that. And we all contribute to that. So now, with that being said, that was the longest part of those three things. So the other three aren't going to go like that. But I just wanted to do, try to do the best that I could because like we said last week, when we read this, like... Right now, we're trying to figure out what Luke was saying when he wrote that. I, it's not, I'm not interested in trying to tell you like, what my best opinion on this is. I'm trying to share the best that I could. If Luke was standing right here, I would read through all the stuff and be like, Luke, here's what I think. Is this what you're trying to say? And in my heart of hearts, I hope he's saying, you know what? Yeah, that's fairly close. That's pretty good. I really hope he's not like, what are you doing, man? Like, <laughs> and then do a sermon on it? Like, that's crazy. Right, I want to understand what like, Luke was saying because the Spirit was guiding him and drawing him through this. And hopefully that's where your heart wants to be. So it's not just so much what can I get out of it. It's what, did, what was the Spirit, what was his main intention and what am I pulling from that? So now, we see this environment that was created where they're just unified and, and it's pure and they're very giving and with one another. And, and, and let me also say before I move on, I don't think ultimately at the end of the day, some people might think, oh, then that means I have to sell all of my stuff and give it to the church. I'm not, that, I don't think that's what Luke was trying to say. I think he's trying to give us a picture of what it was like at that particular moment, and they were embracing what the Spirit was doing in that moment. That's what the Spirit wanted to do that. And he wanted them to literally just share everything, have people lay it at their feet, and that's just the way they're functioning. If God brings us to a season where we're called to share all of our stuff and give all our stuff to the church, I mean, geez, that's like hard to even think about, but... I, you know, I, I guess we'd have to go with it. I, that's hard to even sort of conjure up. Because that's not the ultimate end goal. Like God's not saying, see, give all your stuff away. Ah. It's, he's painting a picture of what the environment was like. And it's important to pull that away. So then now, this will make more sense, hopefully. Or you just might be more confused. Here we go. So, in chapter 5. Now a man named Ananias together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and he put at the apostles' feet. So he got this married couple. What we don't know is what conversations they had, if any, with the apostles previously. The details of the conversations that Ananias and Sapphira had with each other. We have no idea like what happened there. All we know, they sold a piece of property and for whatever reason, they're like, you know what, I'm going to go sell those three acres and you know, we'll give like 85% you know, church and we'll keep like 15. It's not like an inherently horrible thing to do. 
There's nothing like sinful or evil about that. Not all the percentages. I just made that up. Point being, they sold some stuff and they wanted. They decided to keep some. So on the surface, it doesn't look that bad. Verse three. Then Peter said, Ananias. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you receive for the land? That's very interesting. Number one, we didn't read anything about Peter getting any information about Ananias and Sapphira. Nothing. It's kind of like the email thing. He had nothing. Apparently, the Spirit told him, he said, hey, what they're doing isn't exactly what it looks like. Because the pattern had been, people had been selling lands and houses, taking all of it and just laying at their feet and saying, hey, just do with it what you want. And what they did is they took their property, laid it at the feet, but they kept some back. And then Peter says, hey, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Which is very interesting language. Holy Spirit is a person. You could lie to him. Well, how did they lie? Good question. Verse 4. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold? Was the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. In other words, Peter's saying, hey, listen, man, like this was your stuff. You didn't, you didn't have to do this. You know, like we weren't at your door saying, hey, we need your property. Uh, we know it's up for sale. You should really consider giving to the, uh, you know, Peter, John, and Apostles Club. Like, they weren't doing any of that. And that's, that's the purpose of his questioning like that. He's saying, hey, this was yours, and then it was your money afterwards. Like, I'd, why did you decide to do it this way? Why did you lie about it? Verse 5, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Yeah, I bet. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? What a loaded question that is. Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the deception part. The lie, the deception. And that's why I thought the message called exposed because they literally just got, everybody say exposed. 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 They just got exposed. So a couple things. One, like, who hasn't maybe not told the truth about what they gave to a church? That's not the first time. Nor will it be the last. Doesn't this seem kind of extreme? You know, what's going on here? How did he lie? You know, the way that he lied is they were deceptive in that they implied that they gave it all. They were deceptive about because they knew sort of the practice, at least at that current time with that current church. When people were selling their land, their property, their houses, whatever they had, what they were doing is they were giving all of it. Was there a formal definition anywhere that said that? Was there a law in place? No, there was not. But it was just, that's what everybody knew. That's what everybody was doing. There was something weird in Ananias and Sapphira's heart that was like, eh, we'll make it look like we gave all, but we just won't volunteer that we kept some back. And as subtle as that seems, it goes back to the environment. And yet people are like, well, maybe they talked with them about it, and they made a deal that they would, but then they went back and they didn't. But we don't know all that. That's sort of like speculating. But what we do know is you have this one instance of deceit that tried to sneak into this environment that was rich with unity and purity. And you get this massive exposure. Can I suggest to you that that environment that was rich with unity and purity 
it was like this super white cloth and just this little drop. Or like one time we like stained one of those up there. I got in trouble for that, by the way. During communion time. Get some grape juice on that. It's like all you see. And it's like that situation. It was so, like there was so much, everything that was like of the Lord was so good and so right in that. And then the enemy, of course, tried to work his way in with a little bit, not even like horribly bad, deceit. The Holy Spirit said, nope, we're not having that here. Not right now. And here's the interesting. I just want you to think about this. I put two Bible passages up there. You should read them this week and check them out. Old Testament, Leviticus 10 and Joshua 7. Because it's like, why would God do this? It doesn't seem like the punishment really fits the crime. It seems really extreme. And if you think about church like now, I mean, how many people are like looking a particular way and not living it in their own personal lives? And God doesn't kill them immediately on the spot, most of the time. Let me just suggest something to you from the Old Testament. There's something about God and in His nature. What He has done a lot of times through history is when things are being done for the first time, so when God gives the law to the Israelites, to Hebrew, with Moses for the first time, when He sets up a kingdom for the first time, you know, with Daniel, uh, when it's the first time of things being done, first time the church is really coming together. You know, in, in our Bibles there, in verse 11, that's the first time the word church is used in the book of Acts. First time. The first time these things are happening, it's almost like God is really making a statement like, hey, when I said this, I meant this. And in those passages there, in Leviticus 10, again, it wasn't something super awful. God said, hey, here's how you're going to give sacrifices to me. The Levites are going to do it. You're going to do it a particular way. And if it's not like that, you're going to die. And sure enough, somebody went to the altar. They went to do a sacrifice. It wasn't the way God said. And the, the wording in, in the Old Testament is it was a um, uh, prohibited, prohibited fire is like what they call it. Unauthorized fire. That's what they call it. Unauthorized fire. They did the sacrifice. It wasn't right. Bam, they died in the spot. It was, it was Moses, uh, Aaron's brothers. Well, that seems severe. You know, I don't know what to tell you. God is God and I don't know. He goes in harsh ways sometimes. Then in Joshua 7, God told Joshua, hey, listen, go take, go take that. I'm giving, you know, that area to you. Go ahead and go take it. They sent some spies out. They checked it out. They said, oh, okay, it's not actually as big as we thought. We're actually going to cut down our army. Let's go in there. We'll take it. We got the Lord's like favor behind us. He's been delivering this into our hands. So they cut down their army. They take fewer guys. They go in. They lose. They get hammered. <laughs> Joshua comes back. He puts sackcloth on. He's got ashes over his head. He's crying before the Lord. And God's saying, well, yeah, the reason why you lost is because when you took the previous thing, I told you not to take their idols, not to take their gold. I told you to get rid of all that stuff. And someone in the Israelite camp kept it, and they still have it. There's this thing about God's nature. When he says something, he means it, even if we're not disciplined in the immediate moment. And I think sometimes when we see the discipline happening, quick, fast, and in a hurry, it's like, whoa, he can't do that. It goes against what he's like. You know, I don't know about that. He's supremely righteous, holy, amazing. That stuff doesn't go in his presence. It's actually kind of odd that it would take a little while for stuff to sort of be dealt with. And the reason why it's kind of odd sometimes is because there's this thing called grace. And there's a thing called love. And he's pretty long-suffering. Waiting for people to repent. Waiting for people to change. Waiting to create opportunities where people will just, listen, respond to my voice now so you don't get exposed later. He's waiting for those things to happen. And in this moment, we see, wow, I was heavy duty. So then this third one, look at the fruit. Verses 12 through 16. It says, The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. That was a part of the temple there, the outside part. No one else dared join them. <laughs> I bet not. They're kind of freaking out. It's like, wow, you go to that church setting. 
Only, I can't fake it over there. I will get exposed. That's exactly what happened. It, like, don't you think that would change a certain environment? It would automatically make me and make you just be like, okay, I got to make sure that I, I am who I say I am and, I'm, and I'm, I'm like being the real deal. As they say now, I'm keeping it 100. That's what the kids say. It's like Justin's favorite song, Keep It 100. He loves playing that song. And then it says, which is very interesting, read the next verse, verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Oh, okay, so that makes more sense now. So it just filtered out the ones that were on the fence. The non-committals. The ones that were like, I just want to see you like, hang around, see what happens, try and get some free stuff. Filtered them right out of there. The ones that were really interested and wanted to be close to the heart of God and see what he's like and believe in him, they were attracted to that. They're like, oh, that's an environment that I want. It might not be everything that I want to hear, but it's everything that I need. And listen, there's a lot of people like that. And sometimes we have to think, like we have to change ministry all these different kinds of ways. If it ever involves leaving out the truth of sin and who God is and what Jesus is like, people don't want to hear that. They want to hear it for a period of time and just justify their behaviors. At the end of the day, all of us. I mean, let's think about why you're here right now. You're here right now because you honestly care about what God thinks and what He's like, and you want to go after that. And you don't want it sugar-coated. Like, you want the real deal. Amen? Amen. It attracts you. Verse 15, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. <laughs> it doesn't tell us like, if they got healed or not, if, if the shadow did go on them. I, I don't know. But it's pretty interesting that they would be doing that. Maybe they had a couple like, that worked out. You know, I don't know. But again, it gives us a sense of the environment of what the power was like. Verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits. And all of them were healed. Wow, this is awesome. So this last part is the fruit slide. You got that slide, the fruit slide? Here's what happened here. They increased in believers and they increased in supernatural signs and wonders. That's the fruit of an environment that chooses to put unity and purity in high places. I don't want to say it's a formula, but I am saying some good stuff will come of it. When an environment, not just the pastor or pastors or like worship leaders, not just when they decide to make those things a priority, it's when a whole group and they say, this stuff is important. I want to go after this. So this all kind of boils down to what we would call in this day and age, Integrity. Integrity. And if you had to put sort of a visual with integrity, I'm not sure what you would put with it. I know I can put a math term with it because I spend a decent amount of time teaching math. Right now, people are going to zone out. Don't zone out. <laughs> Don't zone out. Because we have, yeah, there's these three dimensions to godly integrity. Because people think that integrity is this. Hey, I'm the same with you and with them, with everyone. Partially true, got a little bit of a problem with it. The problem with it is, you could just be a jerk to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, great. Like, you're keeping it real with everyone, but everyone can't stand you. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we're doing. I right, just speak the truth. Yeah, well, think of a new way to do it. And it's just your version anyway, so come on. Right, so... Godly integrity. Because it's really interesting, you know, Jesus said, blessed are the pure... This is uh, Matthew 5.8. Matthew 5.8. You can write it down, check it out later. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So one of the only beatitudes, you know, where you're going to actually see God. His presence, His purpose, His power, His peace. His presence, His purpose, His power, His peace. The pure in heart get to experience that. So when it comes down to godly integrity, back to math. What do you think about integers? You guys remember the word integer? 
trying to forget about it. Thanks, Pastor, for bringing that bad up. So integers, all it means is, is whole. It means whole. So if you don't remember, integers are part of the number family that have positive and negative whole numbers. And zero is actually also in there. But, but whole numbers, like one, two, three, four. You can help me with this, right? Come on. She's with me. Let's go. And Sal up top, bam, there it is. Whole, right? It means whole. And so what that means is, if in a whole sense of the word, that means my whole life, I'm the same person. In other words, I don't want to be one person right now in front of all of you, and then be another person later, like when I'm with Julie, and another person later when maybe I'm with like some people that I know don't really care about the Lord, and then another person when, you know, uh, um, you know, with a senator or like whoever. It shouldn't change. I should be, and no matter what sphere or people group I'm around, I should have some integrity. Have some integrity. The whole part. And so should you. So you shouldn't change from group to group to group to group. Oh, you know, I'll gossip and say some stuff over here because I'm with them and they like that. But then I won't over here because, you know, then, you know, that's not allowed. But then over here I'll do this and do that. And when my coworkers will say this and, oh man, that just jacks stuff up. That just totally assaults all that unity stuff we just talked about. Just kills it. So then authentic. Another dimension is just being authentic. And being authentic is just like, hey, what you see is what you get. Being transparent. Some people are just so fearful of that. And a lot of people is because they just don't like who they are. And they're afraid if they let other people know what they're like, they're afraid they're not going to get liked. So then if they just built up a whole life of just portraying of kind of like what they're like, people have bought into that and have accepted that, well then now, if you're really going to show people what you're really like, guess how risky that is now. And integrity is like about being authentic, just about being who you are. You know, you might be the person that's the bad dancer, the horrible cook, got a couple funny jokes, maybe got a good jump shot, you know, I don't know. But you got to be who you are. It's really important. It's really important. It's interesting, the word hypocrisy, you know, it comes from that Greek word that what they used to do with plays way back when is they'd have some actors up on the stage, they'd grab a mask like it was on a pole, they put it in front, say all their lines, whatever they would say. Then they get to the next part of somebody else, they grab another mask. Put that down, grab the next one. So then, in Greek, that's where we get our word hypocrite, hypocrisy. It means that you wear like a different mask. People see different parts depending upon where you are and what you're doing. And unfortunately, that's way too prevalent among God's people. Way too prevalent. And God wants to do a different work, a better work, a more beautiful work, a more like designed, destiny-focused work that was, that was you know, intended from the very beginning. And if we've got to put on all these masks, like, it, it just totally takes away from God's good work. Other dimension is, again, godly integrity is being repentful. Being repentful. And so just being able to lay things before God, because integrity, like with other people, those first two, you could do that and not be a Christian. And it's a sad reality when people who aren't Christians do those first two, and they're better than the Christians that are trying to do them. That stinks. Everybody say, that stinks. That stinks. We can do better. We have the power of the Holy Spirit behind us. And it's really important for us to, be to do better. But this last one is just being repentful. Because here's the reality. Like, we all fall into like, these issues and these traps. Some people are still gossiping and they like it. you got to confess that. Right? Some people are. You're just different with different people. So you just got to confess it to the Lord. Just say, Father, I don't know why I'm like that. Like, help. Show me why am I like that. Like we have issues with these things and to be repentful, like it's sinful to not carry out a life that's filled with integrity. It's sinful. It's something that needs to be repented of. Jesus died for that and all the Spirit's looking for from us is a confession that just agrees that we're calling the same thing sin of what He calls and then relying on His help. That's really important and really good. 
But there's a weird thing that just blows through the church where it's like, oh, you better have your smile on and you better like look nice and don't be a mess in front of the church family. Like, Don't go to church if things are really bad. Do you see how that white glove mentality really jacks stuff up? It's still a place of like sinful, broken people. And we could say that all we want, but until you actually allow people to be pretty messy in the church environment and just try and help them and just walk with them, it's just religious jargon. So God is trying to do a really good work. The Spirit is trying to do a good work with us on this area of integrity and purity of heart because there's massive power and benefits behind it. Man, we can just be yourself. It's just freeing. It's attractive to everybody else in the world around you. It's like, oh man, it's just re you know, refreshing. So many benefits to it. So here's what I want to close with. These last two here. So I call this activate. Like, let's activate some integrity because there's obviously like people sitting here and it's like, eh, I'm not doing so hot on that. Or I can do better. And, or you could be sitting here and be like, you know what, I'm killing it. For the first time in my life, I'm having extreme victory and integrity. I am the same person when I'm by myself than if I was preaching in front of people. And if that's the truth, I, my heart completely rejoices. And that is not sarcastic. Because honestly, that's what the Spirit is looking to bring us. To where we actually function in that way. So that way, He uses regular people as models of what integrity looks like. So that way, don't just point to Jesus. They can actually look at our lives. So activate. Let's do this. Let's let the light in. You know, Jesus is called the light of the world. And that light shines just in places, man. I think about, like, my house a lot of times. I'm always uh, more motivated to clean the house when all the windows are open and the doors open and the windows are up and all the light comes in and you can see every piece of dust we're at night? I can't see it. I don't even care. <laughs> but then during the day, I'm like, oh, this place is a mess. So it's a little depressing. But I'm grateful because it helps paint a picture of what it's really like. I'm not trying to live in the dark. Maybe some days. But for the most part, I don't want to stay there. And that's what it comes to with integrity. God is just asking for, those, for people just to be pure in heart. To say, listen, the inside of you is what I look at. That's what the Father's saying. The inside. I'm looking at the inside. What you really like. How you really decide things. The inside is what I like. We live in a society where the image is everything. Everything. Reputation, everything. And God's talking about integrity and character. He's saying, build on that. And the rest of the world is like, oh, how do I look? And how do I dress? And how did it sound? And you got to take four different selfies before you actually post the one that you like. You know, it's, it's like all this weirdness. I'm not saying don't have fun with your selfies. But what I am saying is there's an unhealthy balance. Unhealthy balance of image and reputation and perception. And the Spirit of God has been saying the same thing. He's been saying since day one. He's saying, hey, listen, I want the core inside of you. Just give that over to me. And I promise, I promise, you're never going to regret that. And when I make you beautiful, it's starting from within here. And you're never going to have to fake it another day of your life. Amen. God, that's such good news. And that's just waiting like for us as people. And so when we choose you know, to get alone and just be with the Father and have Him minister those things to our hearts and to our lives, I'll tell you what, you approach and you live in your world in a very different way. And it doesn't mean you won't have issues and difficult things to deal with. But it does mean they don't wreck your peace and they don't sabotage what God is building. And it changes your perspective completely. God doesn't expect us to be perfect, but He does expect us to be honest. Everybody say facts. 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 Word up. Word. <laughs> last one, last one. Let's leave a legacy that lasts. Let's leave a legacy that lasts. Because the thing with reality, with reality, the thing with integrity, you can start right now today. And, you know, like, when everyone comes to the Lord, they, they got all kinds of baggage and things in, in their life that it just it hasn't been real... Uh, Integral. Yeah, Integrous, that's not even a word, but it's not rich in integrity. It's just not. So then you come to this God where that focus is on the inside and impurity and heart, and it's like you've been jacked up for so long. How do you even do that? The reality is you just take advantage of today. 
And you just try to be like as honest and forthcoming and authentic and real with people as you can right now. So when you got issues with someone, you bring it up with someone. Oh, I don't want to. It's going to be a fight. It's going to da da da. Well, you might be right about that. But get some prayer under it first, and then just go do it. If you owe somebody some money, go pay them back. Don't live in debt. Don't let that be like your slave. You know, like if you said you're going to be there for someone, be there for them. You know what I heard like not too long ago? Really, pastor, I really appreciated. He said, you know, he had a son. He was like seven years old. And uh, his son really struggled with like, high anxiety. And he just really did really difficult with crowds. So he told his son, he said, hey, um, there's this kids camp coming up, this like summer kids camp. And, and this guy's a pastor of a very large church. He said, you know, I'll go with you. Like, we'll go hang out at the camp together. Because his son really didn't want to go. And he's like, no, I'll go with you. We'll just hang out the whole time. His son's like, no, 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 no. Okay. So then, this pastor then sets up an appointment to speak at a men's conference, 100,000 men, like a massive conference. That, that's a big deal. So you know what his son did, right? His son goes back, like, you know, a week later and says, Dad, I want you to come with me on this camp. So you know what the pastor did? He called up. He said, hey, I, I can't speak at that conference this year. And it's interesting, this was a while ago, that pr conference was called Promise Keepers. <laughs> Let's go. He had to call promise keepers to tell them that he was breaking a promise. But like, obviously that, that requires wisdom and discernment. But the idea being is that, you know, you just got to say, like, your word has to mean something. Especially in the Christian world. And if you gave your word towards something, and it's getting you like, it's, it's just, you didn't know what it was going to cost, and so now you just want to get out of it, I'm saying fight that with every fiber of your being. See it through. I would say see it through. See it through. see it through. Just go through it and finish it out. You will not regret that. And you will build on integrity and you will build on purity. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So regardless of the past, the pursuit of integrity can start today. And that's true. That's true. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pass out the communion elements. And so now would be the time. And so you can play the other song, like kind of like soft in the background. But now would be the time during communion while you're holding on to the elements. If there's anything that is impure in your heart towards God, why wouldn't you do it in church? Open it up to the Lord in church. Like now. Whatever just might be there that you just know that God just doesn't approve of. And if it's in a good place... Just thank the Lord for His grace to be able to make you able to live as an integrous type of person. And if there's people in your life that you're frustrated with, that are difficult, that you know have real issues when it comes to integrity and being accounted on and being the same person, use this time to pray for them. To pray for them. That wasn't God's plan to have them be that way. And let's have the Christians praying for him. So let's take the time thinking about those things and hold on to the elements. We'll take it together.